Ladies and gentlemen, and distinguished guests, good morning. On behalf of your host, Major General Jansen Boyles, the Adjutant General of Mississippi, welcome to today's change of command ceremony. Today, the command and colors of the Mississippi Air National Guard will be passed from Major General Barry A. Blanchard to Brigadier General Edward H. Evans, Jr. I am Colonel Wyatt Reeves. It's my pleasure to serve as your narrator for today's event. Please stand for the entrance of the official party and remain standing for the playing of the national anthem and the invocation by Chaplain Lieutenant Colonel Shane Moore. During the national anthem, military members will stand at attention and civilian guests should place their right hand over their heart. Good morning. I'm going to pray in my tradition and I ask that you pray in yours. Let's pray together. Christ, I bow before you today to celebrate a change in leadership. We praise you for the contributions of both of these generals. We thank you for the direction and legacy that Major General Blanchard has instilled, for his endurance and integrity throughout his command. We ask that you bless the next chapter in his life and that it would bring you much glory guide him and protect his family lord as general evans takes the mantle of this next leadership position as the air adjutant general that you can continually give him the clarity wisdom and discernment to lead this exemplary mississippi air national guard colossians chapter 3 verses 23 through 24 tells us whatever you do work heartily as for the lord and not for men knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. Guard and guide him, his family, and the airmen he will lead. Lord, you know that normally I ask for something outlandish in this part of the prayer. All I ask that you continue to use General Evans as the leader we know and love, and that may be help the Mississippi State Bulldogs this football season, if it be your will. I ask that you give protection to our Magnolia family that are deployed and in harm's way. Thank you for allowing us to be a part of the Mississippi Air National Guard for God and country. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. Thank you, Chaplain Moore. Also, will you uh, please show Please join me in showing your appreciation for the 41st Army Band who have provided our ceremony. I would like to note that your escorts for today's ceremony are our newest Mississippi Air National Guard Airmen representing the 172nd and the 186th. Please give them a round of applause.
It is now my pleasure to introduce the official party for this morning's ceremony. Major General Jansen Boyles, the Adjutant General of Mississippi. Major General Barry Blanchard, Commander, Mississippi Air National Guard. Brigadier General Edward Evans, Chief of Staff, Mississippi Air National Guard. And Chief Master Sergeant John Myers, Command Chief Master Sergeant, Mississippi Air National Guard. On behalf of Major General Bowles, I'd like to extend a special welcome to General Evans' immediate family and special guests. First, I'd like to recognize the three empty chairs in the front row. These seats were in loving memory of General Evans' father, Technical Sergeant Edward H. Evans, his grandmother, Mrs. Etta Mae Williams, and his grandfather, Master Sergeant Sidney L. Evans. Next, I'd like to welcome Colonel Evans' wife, Priscilla, his daughter, Victoria, his mother, Miss Helen Evans, and mother-in-law, Miss Ann Johnson. I'd like to also welcome our distinguished guests. Major General Clint Walker, Brigadier Generals Mike Cleveland, Joe Hargett, Tommy Tillman, retired general office officers, Augustus Collins, Chris Chrysler, Mike Neighbors, uh, Lynn Cole, uh, Todd Wall, and uh, Zarek Ritchie. Brigade Group Installation of the Army Brigade Group and Installation, the Air Wing Commanders, Joint Staff, Directorates, and the USPFO. Our nominative leaders, Command Sergeants Major Sylvester Tatum, Daryl Masterson, and Command Chief Master Sergeant John Myers, and all other Command Sergeant Majors and Command Chiefs active and retired. Command Chief Warrant Officer Donnie Dukes and all other Senior Warrant Officers active and retired. Uh, the spouses of our, our leaders, please give them a round of applause. Finally, welcome to all the family, friends, retirees, and members of the Mississippi Army and Air National Guard here in attendance today. On behalf of the command, the Mississippi Air National Guard would like to present Mrs. Judy Blanchard with a bouquet of red roses, thanking her for all of her support and devotion to the airmen and the families of the Mississippi Air National Guard. Red roses signify the bonds of loyalty and affection between the command and your family, and to signify that you will be missed. It is also our pleasure to present Ms. Priscilla Evans with a bouquet of yellow roses on behalf of the Mississippi Air National Guard. These flowers represent our friendship and warm welcome to the command. The roses are closed and represent what's yet to come. The Mississippi Air National Guard welcomes the entire Evans family to their new roles. It is now my pleasure to introduce your host for this morning's ceremony, the Adjutant General of Mississippi, Major General Jensen Boyles. Thank you. So well, welcome everybody, and especially to the family. Um, you know, what we do here in uniform, we cannot do without the support of uh, our family and our friends who sometimes fill the gaps back home when we have to be wearing the uniform. So thank you all so much for being here. It means so much to us for you all to be here to support both Ed and Barry. Um, you know, one other thing you might notice about this room is that uh, this is a joint headquarters. You've got both Army here and Air Force here. Um, that doesn't happen across the nation all the time, but in the Mississippi National Guard, I think we all know each other pretty well. And uh, so as you look around the room, we all sort of look the same, but the Air Force and the Army, uh, we really work in Mississippi as one formation, and uh, that is so valuable to what we do. So, so this promotion, and change of ceremony for us is as important to the Army side of what we do as it is to the Air side. So just, just know that too. I'd like to uh, thank uh, our former generals and retirees for being here. You don't have to be here, uh, but your support and interest in continuing to come to our ceremonies and recognize the Guard, thank you all so much for being here to, to support us. It means so much to us for you all to support us in that way. And I've got, I'm gonna take a couple of uh, personal privileges and just simply say that um, Chairman DeBar, Dennis DeBar, we work closely with our Mississippi legislature to make us successful in what we do. Uh, I know you're in uniform today, but uh, Colonel, but uh, thank you for all you do for us in the Mississippi legislature to support uh, what we're chasing up there. And uh, I, one more personal privilege, and she's probably gonna be embarrassed that I say this, but. We also have the Republican nominee for Congress from South Carolina. Sherry, are you in here? So Sherry Biggs is in here on the back row. Um, and uh, I guess she's the Republican nominee in a, Repub in a Republican district. Can I say it that way? 
Okay, all right, so good luck to you in November. Okay, good luck to you in November. But thank you for what you do in your civilian side in addition to what you do in uniform. And I mean that for everybody here. Thank you for what you do on the civilian side and the others. So what you have here today are two uh, in-day soldiers who have a career outside of wearing the uniform and a career with the uniform. And so that's really what we're celebrating today is their transition of command. Um, Barry Blanchard um, really came into this organization and made an impact when we needed it. Barry came in, if I remember right, or Barry, I don't remember, but I'm told that you came in right when we were getting the C-17s, right? And so uh, General Blanchard was a C-17 expert who came in here as we were receiving that equipment to replace the C-141. And he brought that expertise with him when this organization needed some expertise of someone who had that seasoned experience with the C-17 aircraft. And uh, so that's, that's a real incredible benefit that he brought to Mississippi in the 172nd when he joined our organization from active duty. But what really impresses me, and I know impresses all of you, is that as his career continued, and as his peers started going to the airlines, um, Barry eventually transitioned to FedEx, but he stayed in the Mississippi National Guard when a lot of his peers didn't. And I'll tell you, for me personally, uh, that means that means everything, Barry, and it's a reflection of your commitment to the men and women here in this organization and to this, this organization. So, so thank you for your service to the Mississippi National Guard. It means everything to us. Uh, Ed Evans will be taking the command uh, from Barry today. Uh, General Evans uh, is sort of a renaissance man in that uh, he was a 172nd uh, member and a pilot, and he went over to the 186th uh, to serve there and eventually command that unit. I'm going to tell you folks, that doesn't happen very often um, because those organizations have their set officers and command changes and all that. But Ed was one of the first ones to do that. We've done a little cross-pollination since that time, but, but Ed, thank you for sort of leaning forward and helping us uh, become closer together between the two wings during that time period. So. Um, Incredible that you're doing that, and congratulations on being selected to be the next commander of the Air National Guard, and I'm looking forward to working with you in the future. So to both of you, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, General Bowles. Major General Blanchard, will you now make your last remarks to your command? made it large enough so I can actually do it without glasses. That's a good thing. We're off to a good start. <clears throat> so I just want me to welcome everyone. Uh, first and foremost, uh, uh, General Evans family, thank you for coming, uh, family and friends, thank you for coming uh, and witnessing this day and, and supporting uh, his endeavors. Uh, I, I know from my own experience it means a lot to have you here and so thank you for being here today. To all general officers, commanders, our senior enlisted, former uh, A-TAGs, uh, former TAGs, um, uh, members of the Mississippi Army and the Air National Guard, I'll tell you, thank you for taking the time to be here today. Uh, I want to extend a, spurt, uh, a special thank you to the headquarters staff, sir, your staff, for being here. Uh, I, uh, over the last couple of years, uh, as the boss said, we, we've uh, the, the continued um, inclusion of the air into the headquarters, uh, probably unprecedented um, until this date, and continues on. I think it started so with General Neighbors and, and maybe a little bit before that, but uh, really we have certainly integrated uh, both the air and the Army up at the headquarters staff. Uh, and I've gotten to meet so many great uh, Army officers and, and warrant officers and, and general officers, and uh, it's just an incredible a group of people up here. And then also the air staff, where are they sitting at? Where's, where's Meredith, where's, where's all these folks at? There they are in the back there. Thank you guys so much for being here. Um, you truly are a special group of people. 
uh, you made this job fun every day. Uh, I've enjoyed working with you over the last couple of years, and, uh, and, and Ed, especially for you, enjoyed working with you over the last couple of years. Uh, looking forward to um, watching the Mississippi Air National Guard thrive under your leadership. Sir, thank you for the opportunity that you give me here. Uh, it was an incredible experience. So, you know, today I found myself in a, in a sort of a strange situation. Um, normally we're saying goodbye or having changes of command and we're moving on to the next job. And I see your old neighbor smiling back there. Uh, you're moving on. So today it's just a little surreal. But it was not surreal yesterday morning after working all week and waking up at 9 o'clock in my bed going, man, this is nice to have Saturdays off. This is, this is pretty good. Uh, that was actually reality, not, sur not being surreal. When I took this job in March of 22, we were looking at several changes that we were facing. Uh, most of which was driven by either a global pandemic or an ever-changing adversary. As, and as a defense community, we always took notice of, but recently uh, had taken little deliberate action to deal with. Uh, with that in mind, I set out to have three priorities. And that's what, that would really drive my actions over the next three years. Our first priority was to increase our end strength. Uh, COVID had really taken a hit on folks, and uh, whether they decided to get out, continued not to re-enlist. Also, the, the issue with our recruiters not being able to go out and recruit, our end strength really took a hit, as it did across all the Air National Guard. Uh, so one of the first priorities was to make our manning healthy. And so we did that through a couple of uh, um, policies, new policies uh, that the recruiting staff uh, got together. We put some temporary measures in place, maybe to curtail some early uh, exits uh, from our formation, and even implemented some quality of life ideas that were given to me by the wing commanders. And, uh, and I think it took a while, but about 18 months later, we we're finally back on the healthy side again, uh, reaching that over 100% uh, mandate for the state. Um, one of the few states who can actually bolster that. And so uh, lots of credit to commanders uh, on the air side. Lots of credit to commanders, lots of credit to the uh, recruiting staff, my staff. Uh, just an, an awesome job to get that done. Our second priority was to update the focus, my second priority was to update the focus and objective on how we conduct exercise Southern Strike out of the Gulfport CRTC. This was a necessity as a likely scenario of, uh, we faced from our new adversary meant a change from counterinsurgency ops to peer-to-peer -peer large scale military operations. And to put it simply, China was a new threat and we need to prepare differently for that fight. Uh, Exercise Southern Strike, which is a joint multi-component, meaning active duty guard and reserve, and included our international coalition partners, had to evolve to prepare uh, for this uh, threat scenario. And it's important to me for three reasons. We needed to continue to showcase Gulfport CRTC as a world-class training facility, and in particular its ability to host a new complex combat scenario because of its strategic placement on the coast, with easy access to over 15,000 square miles of military airspace, as well as access to Camp Shelby ranges to support and facilitate training with our joint partners. Gulfport not only provides this world-class training for the benefit of our nation's defense, but also provides a significant economic boost to the tune of several million dollars during these, during these exercises. The second reason this was important to me was to continue to showcase the capability of both of our wings in the state. We're a mobility state, if you haven't noticed, with C-17s and KC-135s. And mobility operations, although not open, openly stated much, are the key to our new strategy for China. Simply put, we need to project power halfway around the world without much warning. That requires an intense initial logistical push to deploy assets and a continual logistical input to sustain operations and redeploy forces to a different area and theater if needed due to a threat. This fight's reliance on mobility operations, whether it's refueling fighters, refu refueling cargo aircraft, or cargo aircraft delivering combat power to, to the theater is the cornerstone that holds this new plan together 
and our state has the professionals that can make it happen day in and day out. Uh, the last reason it was important to me was it provided, it provided our Mississippi National Guard, not just air, but also Army, the opportunity to participate in a world-class exercise getting after all these new objectives, all these new objectors right in our own backyard. As commanders, we were responsible that our soldiers and airmen not only have the tools they need, but the training needed to be successful in the next fight. This exercise provides the opportunity right here in our state with full access to its learning opportunities right here at home. So I, I know it was, it was difficult during times during that change. Uh, anyone who happened to be a director of Southern Strike uh, can attest to that. Uh, there are many competing interests in the way, but uh, every one of them pushed the ball forward. I think we're better because of it. I see one of our directors sitting right there, Rick Weaver. Um, I think we're better because of it. Uh, I think it's incredible. Uh, we have incredible momentum pushing forward with this exercise. And it is, in my opinion, imperative that we keep the ball rolling and continue to prepare for that next fight. And I'll tell you the last priority I thought we needed to address was the opportunity to seek out future mission sets and possibly a new weapon system. With the reality that there was a definite shift in the Department of Defense on where we were placing our focus and who our new threat was, it was evident that some current mission sets would change to meet the needs of our new posture. And new weapon systems with additional capabilities were needed to meet these threats. I immediately contacted the 186 uh, Refueling Wing Commander, Cindy Smith. We talked about it and we admit, immediately approached uh, General Boyles, his staff, and our legislative, legislative liaison. While the final outcome of uh, that competition will not be completed until after I leave, I have no doubt, thanks to the incredible efforts of so many of you on both wings, 186 and the 172nd, Britt, thanks for your support uh, along the way also with helping them get, get to this point. Um, the headquarters staff, especially our legislative liaison, the governor and his staff, our codos and their staff, I think we're in the best position we could possibly be in. And I have no doubt we'll compete strongly and given a fair shake, take delivery of KC-46s in 2030. To the airmen of the Mississippi Air National Guard, you will continue to face a challenging future as we adjust force structure, deployment posture, and potentially reorganization of MAGCOMs. We know that change is ever present, but one thing is constant in our alliance. One thing is constant, and that is our alliance on our Guard family in turbulent times. Please continue to take care of one another as you have always done. To the commanders, continue taking care of your people. You are nothing without them. Do your very best in all your endeavors. Do your very best for your people, and do your very best for this organization. Ed, even though we have uh, made some good strides, there's still a lot of work left to be done. Uh, but I know you're the right person for this job, so I say good luck to you, Priscilla. Lastly, to everyone here, I'm filled with gratitude for your service, whether you wear the uniform or not, whether you're retired or maybe just joining. I'm filled with gratitude for your service and the opportunity to have served alongside each one of you. With dedication, resilience, and professionalism, you demonstrate day in and day out, give me immense pride, and give me great hope for the future of the Mississippi National Guard. So God bless the U.S. and God bless the Mississippi National Guard. Thank you. Thank you, General Blanchard. There's uh, no doubt the Airmen of Mississippi Air National Guard have benefited from your leadership over these past two years. We wish you well and hopefully uh, hope you enjoy your retirement. Please be seated. The change of command ceremony has rich military history dating back to the reign of Frederick the Great of Prussia during the 18th century. At that time, organizational flags were developed with color arrangements and symbology unique to each unit. 
The colors are the commander's symbol of authority, representing his responsibility to the organization. To this flag and its commander, the uh, soldiers of the unit would de dedicate their loyalty and trust. When a change of command occurred, the flag was passed to the individual assuming command, symbolizing the transfer of the mantle of leadership in the presence of the unit members, so all may witness their new leader assuming his official position. This symbolic tradition has survived throughout military history and is the key event in today's ceremony. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the change of command ceremony. Generals, please step forward and take your positions. Attention to orders. By direction of the President, Brigade, Brigadier General Edward H. Evans, Jr. is appointed commander, Mississippi Air National Guard, effective 29 May 2024, as authorized by the Major General Jansen D. Bowles, the Adjutant General of the State of Mississippi. You may be seated. Congratulations, uh, General, Brigadier General Evans. Uh, Mississippi Air National Guard is looking forward to years of your discerning leadership. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the commander of Mississippi Air National Guard, Brigadier General Evan, Edward Evans. Well, thank you so much, Wyatt. Thanks to everybody out here. I'm looking at my chaplain here, Chaplain. Uh, Chaplain Shane, um, we are praying for those bulldogs this year. <laughs> I'm glad that's what you think of when you think of me in this, uh, in this day. You, you know it's real. So thank you all so much. Thank you for being here. I want to start and share just a quick story. Uh, about a month ago, on the 19th of June, Juneteenth, Juneteenth holiday, I had the honor and privilege of uh, flying as captain of a um, honor flight an honor flight from Atlanta to our nation's capital. If you're not familiar with the honor flight network, uh, I'm sure you've seen this. These are flights where you see veterans of previous wars who are all together. They fly on various airlines to our nation's capital where they visit the monuments that commemorate the wars in which they served. On this particular flight, uh, Southwest had the privilege of operating the first Juneteenth all African American veteran flight um, to uh, again to, to the nation's capital, and I got picked to go do that. And as I'm looking at the list of veterans, I see there is a uh, World War II veteran, 101 years old. His name is Calvin Kemp. And He's the first person I was looking forward to meeting when, uh, when I showed up for the flight. So as I pick him out in the, in the crowd and in the group, I walk over to him and I've got my hat on, I got my, my airline uniform, you know, I'm, I'm in that capacity. And I walk over to him to shake his hand and unapologetically, he looks at me and the first thing he says is, you stand on my shoulders. And I thought about that. And I look at him and I say, yes, sir, I do stand on your shoulders. And um, I, I thank him for his service. Uh, again, he served at a time where uh, it was a little different across the country. And our, our, our environment was a little different, but there were so many who answered the call to duty. 
Um, we had the privilege just recently of uh, commemorating uh, D-Day on a staff ride, and we took a trip out to France, many of the members of the National Guard. So this era is fresh on my mind. So again, as I'm thinking of his unapologetic statement of, you stand on my shoulders, I wanted to expand that a little because, uh, well, yes, sir, we, we do stand on your shoulders. And there were a couple of the dozens of, of veterans in the, in the gatehouse, and I look at them and I stand on their shoulders. As I look across this room and I see the members who've come before me, I want to say to you, I stand on your, sh your shoulders. Because as you look at this, we're, we're all connected. Uh, these aren't individual pursuits. This isn't an individual race. It's not a sprint or a marathon. We hear that all the time. This is a relay race. It's a collective experience where one hands the baton to the next, where we advance the race, we advance the mission from time to time, from day to day, using the people that we have. So again, as I look across this room, I see many in which I stand on their shoulders. And I'll just say, just first off, General Blanchard, thank you so much. You ran a very strong race. Uh, you have put us in a position where we can capitalize on your priorities and incorporate that into what we do today and what we'll do tomorrow. So for that, I'm forever grateful. Judy, thank you so much um, for all of your support over the years. We've all known each other for a long time. That's just one of the strengths of the National Guard. Um, we're a unit who works together. We grew up together. Our kids swam and played sports together. So we've known each other a long time and we're able to capitalize on many of those things. I hadn't looked at my notes. I'm just kind of talking, right? <laughs> but um, I, I did see, I, I want to go back to Mr. Kemp. Uh, and again, uh, the D-Day experience is really fresh. There are over 14 and a half million Americans who served in World War II. Today, there are fewer than 120,000 of those patriots left. Um, that gentleman was a national treasure, or is a national treasure. And his words stick with me because, um, you know, I just think of that as really a, a statement for us in so many ways. We stand on the shoulders of our military institution, um, and that is made up of so many people who are here today. Uh, Military members, civilians, uh, retirees, active folks, you know, th there's just, just so much that we have in this tradition that we can um, leverage and capitalize as we move on. So I'll get off that soapbox. I want to thank several folks who are here today for your support. Um, General Boyles, this is the second change of command in which you officiated, so I thank you for your trust, sir. I thank you for all you've done to uh, set the conditions put me in a situation where we can carry out the mission of our great organization. Before you, General Collins, there's several former tags here, um, former general officers here. Uh, I, I see at least three of my former wing commanders uh, right in front of me, and uh, you guys poured into me, uh, into the members here, and it allows us to get to this situation. Feels a little down right now. I hope I'm not getting you know too deep or setting the tone that's just uh, a bit solace. I think this is a, a cheerful event. So uh, let me smile, let me laugh a little bit here, and maybe I can change things up a little bit. But uh, <laughs> he'll stay. There we go. So <laughs> appreciate that. Uh, uh, and I also just want to mention uh, my, my command chief, um, John Myers. He's a he's a very formal individual. He, he stopped me this morning and said, "Hey, once again, uh, sir, you, you didn't select me, but I want to ask for the honor of serving as your state command chief." And I say to him, "We're good. <laughs> um, keep doing what you do, chief. Very We're all good." <laughs> in fact, uh, he's the second chief that I'm looking at in this room who wasn't uh, my pick. Uh, when I was wing commander at Meridian, I inherited another chief who, as I'm walking in, I was like, well, I don't really know this guy, but uh, they say he's a good guy. And Chief Ron Arthur, one of the finest members I've ever served with, thank you for being here. So uh, if you want to talk to anybody, you know, there's a guy right there. Uh, yeah, we, we work extremely well together. We're still friends, and uh, we have so many things in common, which, first and foremost, 
the success and the health of the Mississippi Air National Guard. So um, I'll kind of fast forward a little bit here and um, move along. Um, my grandfather, as you all know, you know my story. Uh, he was an original Tuskegee Airman. It, it was his service that kind of trickled down to influence my father and my uncle, and all that kind of trickled into me, and that's one of the reasons why I'm here today. I actually didn't know much about the Air Guard. I was a student at Mississippi State, um, in ROTC, destined for active duty. My then girlfriend, wife now, was a student at Jackson State. And as I'm driving back and forth from, uh, from Starkville to, to Jackson, um, I'd see 141s in the pattern on uh, Highway 25. I'm like, what are 141s doing in Jackson? So all that to say, this best kept secret mentality is one that we've been attempting and we definitely have to break. We've got to promote our organization. We have to make sure that everyone in the state, everyone around, uh, is aware of what we do, how we serve, what we offer, and what our contributions are to our state and our country. And we will definitely break down those barriers. Um, so again, to my wife, thank you so much for your love and support over the years. Uh, she left home on Wednesday. My youngest daughter is in Philadelphia right now playing lacrosse. Uh, so Priscilla leaves on Wednesday, gets her up there, comes back Friday night. We had a funeral yesterday, a member of our family passed away, and she's getting on a plane again at 12 o'clock to, uh, to get back to Baltimore and, and recover Julia back home on uh, Monday night. So it's kind of the life we live. She's uh, embraced it. She's been with me for over 30 years uh, in marriage, and we've been doing this military thing for uh, just as long. So. Thank you, baby. Thank you for all you do, and thank you for your support. So I've got three daughters, one of which is here, and you know this is where I put Tori on the spot, right? She's the uh, she's a recent graduate of Loyola University in Chicago. Um, just finished about a month ago. Her plans are to move on to Iowa State to uh, attend graduate school. So. She's one of those save the earth kind of people. Um, uh, she's an environmental leadership. She wants to teach that. She wants to go into academia, and I know absolutely uh, you can do it. So, so proud of you. Um, I wish your other two sisters were here uh, to be a part, but my, my middle daughter, Lauren, is a, uh, a sophomore at Oklahoma. Best thing I can say about that, at least she went to an SEC school, right? Um, <laughs> She couldn't be here and again. I mentioned Julia. Uh, Julia is playing lacrosse and she wants to be a D1 player at a major university somewhere along the way and I'm sure she'll get that done. To my dear mother, Helen, always with me, always has been, always will be. Thank you so much. To my uh, mother-in-law, who's just like a mother, Ms. Ann Johnson, thank you for being here. And let me highlight just a couple of my, my, my cousins, my, my ride or dies. It doesn't matter if they get short notice, no notice. When they hear somebody in the family's got something going on, they rally and they're here. So to you guys, this, this, is, a, this is my King T branch, as, as I like to say. Uh, they're always here and um, I just love you all to death. Um, so many friends. Doc Jones, retired Navy captain, um, thank you. You and your family have been a blessing to us. Uh, thank you for your support. And I'll just take just one bit of uh, liberty. Um, the, the Cattles, um, just great friends. You guys are you know, godparents to my daughter. So uh, that tells you just what they mean uh, to, to us. Where, so many folks here, and if I don't call your name, just don't, don't hold it against me. Uh, I know we've been kind of in this situation for a while, so I'll try to speed things up. But uh, as General Boyle would say, one, one bit of personal privilege. Um, there's also a member I see here, uh, retired Air Force Colonel. Um, we've been friends since 90 or 91, where we're, we're both fraternity brothers from our college days. And I kind of tease him, and I call him Mr. Mayor. 
even though the election hadn't happened, but uh, um, Tim Henderson uh, is with us this morning, the candidate for Jackson mayor. And I'll just say this about Tim, uh, career Air Force officer, um, I know for a fact that our values are strong in him. Integrity first, service before self, and excellence in all we do. Character, competence, make up this individual, and I hope everyone gets a chance to meet him here pretty soon. Um, you heard the priorities of my predecessor. Um, I'll just say my priorities are very similar. Uh, they're simple. That's to be the right leader for the challenges that we face today. Uh, we've got priorities in place that we will certainly continue. We'll make adjustments. We'll expand where we have to, but we've got an excellent plan. So we'll, we'll continue in that tradition. We'll ensure the readiness, training, uh, and focus on our people is right there at the top in midst of all the change and turmoil in which we're facing. So to, just to use a sports analogy here, our adversaries have seen the tape, they watched the film, they know our plays. It's up to us to get bigger, stronger, faster, to come up with new plays to adjust and make these halftime decisions so that once the conflict, or if the conflict ever happens, we're able to go. And that's what I'm counting on the members of our units to do in your particular fields. As we mentioned, we've got a mobility state here. We've got the premier airlift wing in the nation at the 172nd. We've got an air refueling wing that goes back to the cradle of air refueling with just an immense amount of history that we will leverage. And our goal there is to ensure that we have an enduring air refueling mission. Sounds a lot, sounds a lot like the KC-46, but um, whatever it is, I know we'll continue to compete in that area. And for our third installation on the coast, the CRTC. I'd like to say that um, since I'm from Gulfport and I've sweated in multiple operational readiness exercises in Mach 4 in Gulfport, that uh, even though I wasn't assigned there directly of our three installations, I like to say I'm one of the few commanders uh, to, to hold this position to have service in each one of our units. And uh, we will definitely leverage that with the knowledge of the men and women in our missions and our challenges. So um, I think I've talked enough. Uh, <laughs> I think you all have an idea of what it is that we need to do. I'll uh, simply say our staffing, and this no, no poke at the National Guard, although we're at 100% manning, that is a perishable statistic. Um, it's, it's up to us to make sure that our rates, that our stats and our staffing maintain and meet our goals, because it is very difficult to request an appeal for new missions if we can't manage the ones that we have right now. So um, I, I'm gonna close with just uh, one other thought here. Um, in my 31 years of service, I've learned that people join the military for a variety of reasons. Some of them know exactly what they wanna do when they raise their hand. I wanna fly airplanes, or I wanna be uh, a lawyer, or I wanna be this or that. Uh, some join to be a part of something bigger than themselves. Some join to improve their situations. You know, there's money for college, there's educational benefits, there's all these, these recruiting tactics to try to get people in the door. Um, and we do have a few that join to escape their situation. You know, I'm just looking for a better life and to get out of what I am right now. Whatever their reasons, we need them. We need them all. And uh, in addition to that, those are reasons people join, but it's also important for us to acknowledge the reasons people stay. So there's a recruiting side and there's a retention side, right? We've got to set the conditions so that our members enjoy what they're doing, they actually get a chance to do what they signed up to do, and they enjoy the service from an individual standpoint as well as from the collective. That, that's our job. Um, we've got to balance all those things, mission, people, service, and sometimes there's a little focus that we have to do on each of them. But at the end of the day, 
they all go hand in hand in hand and it's my job to set those conditions it's my job to ensure that the leaders that we have at our ins installations and in our our units and our missions lead by example hold and maintain the standard and live by our core values so um, that's what we intend to do um, I hung out with the Army yesterday at Fort Liberty for about a, for a whole day. A buddy of mine retired um, as a commanding general of their use of KPOC organization. And uh, one of the things that they said is, best thing we can do in recruiting is get out and tell the Army story. We're going to take that because the best thing we can do to recruit and retain is to tell our story. For each member of this Air National Guard, of this National Guard, to get out in your communities, to talk in the schools, to be an ambassador for what we know and what we love. So uh, I'll leave you with that. Uh, again, we stand on the shoulders of great men and women who come before us in this organization. All policies and procedures remain in effect. Thank you for supporting the Mississippi Air National Guard. Please be seated. Thank you, Brigadier General Evans, and congratulations on your command. There were many people involved in making this ceremony a success. would like to recognize public affairs for the program, photos, and streaming video, the headquarters staff for the setup, rec uh, reception, and tasks behind the scenes, our escorts, and the 41st uh, band for our music today. Thank you for all you've done. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the benediction, playing of the Air Force song, and departure of the official party. Christ, we bow before you. Thank you for such a wonderful ceremony. God, we ask for your protection as we go for our good and your glory. In your name, Christ, I pray. Amen. Amen. And if you don't know the Air Force song, it's on the back of your program. I'll make sure we hear that. All right? It's a feeling of honor and privilege uh, more than anything else. Uh, I fall in a line of great leaders who come before me and to have the opportunity to stand in this seat to lead the men and women of the Mississippi Air National Guard is just outstanding. So the, the role is massive if you try to do it all yourself and uh, that's certainly not my plan. You know, we've got tremendous folks in our organization at all levels where we are able to spread this out and make sure that they're functioning and operating at their max potential so that they can execute and handle these things. So my job is guidance. My job is to stay true to our priorities, continue our focus on readiness, training, taking care of our people so that our people can execute the mission that we're called to do from a federal and state standpoint. Hey, I, I'm here to tell my story, and uh, I'm here to share what the Mississippi Air National Guard and the U.S. military has done for me personally and allowed me to do in return for our, our mission in our country. So uh, I want to get out in every opportunity, you know, to just say, you know, if you want to be part of something a bit greater than yourself, 
And that is something that not everybody understands, but service is something that not only benefits others, but it, it, it benefits me as an individual. So uh, I could take those traits and transform them wherever we go, either in uniform or out of uniform. If you learn to serve, and this is a great place to do that, you can do it anywhere and people will benefit from that. My granddad means a lot to me. His service, the group in which he operated and served means a lot to me as well as everybody else. So if he were here today, he'd probably tell me what that other uh, World War II guy said. You stand on my shoulders. <laughs> and uh, I absolutely do. It's a, uh, it's a true statement and it's a, uh, it's a challenge for us that we have to live up to that standard. Uh, when called to operate, when called to duty, we've got to be there. We've got to do our part to continue what we, we know here as the United States of America. Yeah, so I'm the Adjutant General for the state of Mississippi, and I have under me both an Army and an Air Command. And so today we had a change of command on our air side. Uh, Mississippi is a national player in air mobility uh, across the world. And uh, when the Air Force or the Pentagon needs transportation, Jackson, Mississippi is who they call for cargo, moving cargo around the world, and Meridian is who they call when they need air refueling in this region or around the world. And so Ed Evans is taking command from Barry Blanchard uh, to, to move this great organization forward in this hard work that they do every day. Great, great question. So the National Guard is different from active duty, right? Active duty, they wear the uniform every day and bring those skill sets to the act to their job every day. In this case, Barry Blanchard, the outgoing commander, flies for FedEx. So he sees, he has civilian perspective that he brings to his military job. Ed Evans is an executive with Southwest Airlines, and he brings that managerial experience and pilot experience to this job. Uh, I will argue that that makes them a much better commander because they have such a wealth of experience in both the civilian and the military world. And so for Ed Evans, he's the man for the job. It's his time. He has experience in both of our cargo wing and our air refueling wing in command positions. And so he brings the experience of both of those wings to this command job. Well, I, th I think you'll see from talking to General Evans that he's a leader. And so he brings a real leadership skill to that. Um, we, you know, it's important that the two wings uh, and all the Air Force commands within the state work together. And so his experience in both will help facilitate that. He has a lot of experience working with the Army. You know, the Air Force and the Army work together in transporting men and women across the organization. Our DOMS uh, commander that works for hurricanes is Air Force, not Army. Our um, uh, communications director is the Air Force, not Army. We all work together to make this one organization a great organization of both Army and Air. And Ed has experience working with the Army, so he'll complement that also. So great question. And so the answer is that what we're training for in the future is a much bigger conflict. And so we have to know how to work together to be prepared for that conflict. We have an exercise we call Southern Strike that puts Army resources and Air Force resources together and they work together from the ground to close air support all the way up to strategic air support. And so we have to be understand how to move a soldier from the battlefield to a station and get that soldier transported to another station and another station and it requires that interaction to do that. I mentioned also there are things that the Air Force does better than the Army. Uh, there are things that the Army does better than the Air Force just because of the environment we're in. Uh, communications is very challenging in the Air Force. They do a very good job with that, which is why I have an Air Force uh, communications director who works both with the Army and the Air Force.